I was just reading your 2025 outlook. Um, kind of a wild card may have been thrown into the mix just last night by the president-elect. I, I want to ask you, does the idea of these tariffs on China and uh, Mexico and Canada, does that change your outlook at all when it comes to 2025? The idea of them, we don't know if it's actually going to happen, of course. Right, that is a great question. And what you've done there is, is, is touch on the key uh, aspect of our outlook. Uh, one of the challenges that we see in outlooks that appear this time of year is that everyone becomes obsessed with making short-term predictions of what their market's going to do over the next six months or, or a year. And what we've tried to do at Morningstar is take a step back and think about the longer term. Think about the things that are really going to impact investors that are saving towards their retirement or they're investing in retirement. Uh, and as we take that approach, uh, then one of the, the dangers that we see is that investors get caught up in these narratives. Uh, so whether it's uh, what, uh, what the president-elect is, is currently doing, whether it's what's happening elsewhere in the, in the world, all of the challenges we're seeing in geopolitics, it's very easy to grab hold of one of these narratives and assume that's the only way Way that the future can unfold. But we well, know Dan, that the future let, let's is Let's let go uncertain. of the narrative. Yes, go ahead. Let's get to the reality yes. then. I mean, let's, let's forget about the, these narratives and these other distractions. I mean, what are you really seeing in 2025? In your mind, what is going to work next year after a really strong year, at least so far this year? Well, that, that's a key point, that the, it has been a very strong year this year. What we've seen is uh, prices rise, valuations get richer, as you mentioned, particularly in some parts of the market, particularly in that larger growth oriented more technology-enabled part of the market. We're seeing that as being quite expensive. So when we look at our best investment ideas in 2025, then it's really away from that part of the market that's done so well this year. What we're looking at is uh, smaller companies in the U.S., more value oriented companies, traditional industries. Uh, where we're seeing a big discount still to, uh, to fair values. And then as we look overseas, uh, we still see uh, great opportunities in Europe, particularly in the UK, okay. and some of the emerging markets. So it's, it's about uh, looking beyond, as you said, uh, those narratives and really focusing on long-term quality and valuation. Yeah. I want to go uh, run down through a couple of the points in your report. Uh, very interesting read, by the way. So you're very bullish on the European markets, specifically the UK, as you mentioned, the FTSE 100, in fact. Uh, FTSE 100 is actually a laggard of the S&P only up about 7%. You also like bonds in this situation. I think that's interesting. A lot of people kind of feel like bonds are a bit tricky. Uh, let's get a little bit more granular. When we're talking about bonds, you're talking about treasuries. Where are you seeing the opportunity in treasuries? What duration? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question because bonds, uh, when you're investing in that part of the, the capital markets, the reason you're holding bonds becomes really important. Uh, so some people will own bonds to try and uh, generate returns, particularly bond fund managers, of course, uh, and there they tend to be driven more towards the riskier end. So high yields, corporate bonds, where you can get some extra spread. But as multi-asset investors, uh, then when we look at bonds, the role that they typically play in a portfolio is to provide some downside protection particularly in a recessionary environment. So if we don't have that soft landing play out, if we have a hard landing, uh, which is one of the possible outcomes, then you'll want some bonds in your portfolio. A lot of people at the moment are holding cash. Uh, we know there's been big right. flows into uh, money market funds in the last year. And so we think people should uh, go further out on the, uh, the yield curve, looking at that sort of five, seven-year uh, duration okay. period where uh, what, there's what people some good value in Treasury bonds. You see the opportunity yes, what people exactly. generally call the value the of the curve. Dan, we're almost out of time. i got to ask you one other question. Uh, in your note, you say the U.S. market is very expensive. We're going to show the forward P of the S&P. That's 23 times. The Nasdaq, 31 times. The Russell, again, all-time high, 33 times. If the U.S. market is expensive, very quickly, where's the opportunity? Is there a sector where you see opportunity? or Is there a certain subsector? I mean, where's the opportunity in a quote-unquote expensive market? Yes, the opportunity is to dig deeper, uh, to look at those smaller companies, those mid-sized companies that haven't had that bounce away from the uh, technology-enabled large-cap stocks. There's plenty of opportunities across the sectors if you dig a little bit more deeper. So that's the mantra for 25, dig deeper into capital markets.